perseverance. And I have to say, you people certainly show an awful lot of it. I continue to be here at this time of night with another round. We turn now in Holy Scripture to Nehemiah chapters 7 and 8. Nehemiah 7 and 8. I will read part of 7 and all of 8. Nehemiah chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. This is what Holy Scripture says. After the wall had been rebuilt, and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. I said to them, The gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. Now, the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the, no the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. This is what I found written there. These are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive. He returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ra'amiah, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Misperet, Bigvai, Nehum, and Ba'ana, and then the various lists, the list of the men of Israel, the men of Bethlehem, and the men of Bethlehem, and so on, so on, so on. Certain people, however, verse 64, searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor, therefore, ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food, until there should be a priest ministering with the Urim and Thummim. The whole company numbered 42,360, besides their 7,337 men servants and maid servants, and they also had 245 men and women singers. There were 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. Some of the heads of the families contributed to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 drachmas of gold, 50 bowls, and 530 garments for priests. Some of the heads of the families gave to the treasury for the work 20,000 drachmas of gold, 2,200 minas of silver. The toll given by the rest of the people was 20,000 drachmas of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, 67 garments for priests. The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and the temple servants, along with certain of the people and the rest of the Israelites, settled in their own towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Metathiah, Shema, Aniah, Yohiah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, 
has by the now Zechariah and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jami, Aku, Shabbethai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kavita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Beliah, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and to drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families <coughs> Along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scribe to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves booths on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built booths and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this, and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the feast for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. That takes us to chapter 9. This is the word of the Lord. Now I suppose if you read Nehemiah once every 10 years, and you perhaps come across a couple of popular books on Nehemiah, you might be excused for thinking that the book of Nehemiah is primarily about the rebuilding of the wall. But by now it should be clear that that is, in fact, a relatively minor point. It is something that is essential, but it is a means to an end, rather than the end itself. After all, we've already seen that in chapter 6, verse 15, that that was already built, that the wall is already built. We still have chapter 7 to 13. And although, initially... Nehemiah's question to those who returned from exile, back in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, asked about how Jerusalem was doing. He also asked about how the remnant was doing. He does not see the building of the wall as the final end, the end of all ends. Once the wall is built, he can turn around and go home. To rebuild Jerusalem.
Jerusalem means more than rebuilding the wall. It means rebuilding the community, building the people of God, rebuilding the city as an interlocking community of God's covenant people, not merely building the wall around the outside. What becomes clear in the rest of the book is that Nehemiah is interested in rebuilding the entire community, living under the scripture that God has given under the terms of the covenant. But the first steps of fostering this larger vision are worked out in chapters 7 and 8. First of all, the physical protection of a pilgrim people, verse, uh, chapter 7, and then secondly, the spiritual nourishment of this pilgrim people, chapter 8. So we come to chapter 7. The wall is complete, chapter 6, 15. And chapter 7 reminds us that the gates have been hung too, so the job is done. But this raises the question of who the gatekeeper should be, the security personnel. Because even after a wall is built and you've got gates in place, it's not more secure than the security personnel who handle the gates. If you have a whole lot of untrustworthy people handling the gates, then the city is still completely insecure. And this then introduces us to Nehemiah's first appointments. He says, after the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. Probably this does not mean gatekeepers to be gatekeepers, singers to be singers, and so on. It probably means they were appointed then as the security personnel. And you start looking at this and you say, you appoint singers for security personnel? I mean... You know, maybe they really are good at a cappella or playing guitars or whatever they do, but how does that qualify them to make them security personnel? Well, the fact of the matter is that although the temple was small, it was there and it was operating so that you had some people already in Jerusalem doing it. They were the ones that knew this terrain. They were on their home patch. Most of the others were still living outside of town in other places. So he appoints the people who are here, already in town, connected with the temple, the Levites, the singers, and whatever gatekeepers were already operating. And then, of course, you have to have leadership for this lot. And he appoints his brother, who was mentioned, if you recall, back in chapter 1, verse 2, the brother that first came from Jerusalem, back to Susa, in order to give a report to Nehemiah, and Hananiah, the military officer, who is in charge of the citadel near the temple, according to chapter 3, verse 8. Now, what does he look for in them? Hananiah is mentioned in particular. He appoints him because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. Isn't that interesting? Nehemiah is not too worried about the charge of nepotism. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm the governor. I, I make my uh, brother the, the, the head of security forces. <coughs> if you just look at it from uh, the perspective that nepotism is always bad, then clearly this is nepotism, and it's bad. But his criteria are not bound up with bloodlines. His criteria are bound up with integrity and fearing God more than most men do. Why those two things? Well, it's important to understand, first of all, what integrity is. What is integrity? It doesn't work like this in Hebrew, but it works very well in English. Integrity is cognate with integer, a whole number. <clears throat> a person with integrity is a whole person. That is to say, regardless of the etymology of words, integrity in a person, makes that person the same on the inside as on the outside. The same in private as in public. It's relatively easy, for example, to have a, a public show of piety if we're part of a, an ecclesiastical community. But does that public show of piety mean that the person is really diligent in his or her own prayer life and makes sure that he never watches porn on the internet? Or is he two people? God knows that this side of the consummation, we all lack integrity in some measure. That's going to be one of the wonderful things about the consummation. We will forever be people of the utmost integrity. Ex 
exactly the same on the inside as on the outside. But we have to admit, quite frankly, that integrity does not characterize all our ways all the time. When we throw in what we think and what we might say in the privacy of our home versus what we would admit in the public forum of the local church. But at least if you're a Christian, you realize that that's the ideal. You, you remember the text which, which, which Jesus gives us about how murder and hatred are of the same species. It's not just in the act, it's in, it's in how you, you view people. If you hate them, then, then, then you've already fallen into this species of sin. It's not just whether or not you've committed adultery, but whether you've succumbed to lust. And you've fallen into the same species of sin. The question is what you are on the inside as well as what you do on the outside. And so Christians, if they're Christians at all, know that part of Christian maturation is bringing those two things together. That's why the New Testament insists that double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's why Jesus talks about the importance of the single eye. The single eye, with one vision, one direction, one priority. Do you see? So you want, in places of security, people who are stamped by integrity. Because they won't be duplicitous. They won't be two-faced. They won't be hiding something. And then you also want them to be people who fear the Lord more than most men do. Because, if you truly do fear the Lord, then you don't fear anyone else. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs tells us. Because if you really fear the Lord, then you don't fear the threats of outsiders, you're not interested in bribes, you don't care what people think of you, you fear the Lord. And that means you want to handle everybody exactly the same way, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're trying to bribe you or not. You're dealing with men and women made in the image of God. You're dealing with brothers and sisters who are part of the covenant community. You fear the Lord. That's the anchoring point for polite, civil, firm, relationships of integrity and civil discourse and in the local church, you see? And if you don't fear the Lord, then you're far more likely to fear popular opinion. Fear what your mates say. Fear your boss. Fear your family's views. And on and on and on. Where does it stop? How do you trust those people with security? Or with anything else for that matter? Nehemiah's got it exactly right. The criteria are bang on. I chose my brother, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. And then he gives some particular instructions to them. They're not to open the gate, we're told, until the sun is hot. Now, it's not that Nehemiah is worried about temperature. That's not the point. The point is that, of course, in those days, they didn't have electric lights all over the place. So that until the sun is up enough to be hot, you don't have an awful lot of light. You open the gates at the first crack of dawn, and there's still a lot of darkness and dust around, and people could sneak in, and shawls over their head, muffle their voices, you don't really know who's there, unless you get them all their hoods and look inside. Did you see? So he, he wants to make sure that there's lots of light, and you can do your inspections easily, clearly, and nobody's sneaking in in the, in the gloom. Likewise, at close of day. Practical instructions. All of this was especially important when the city still had so few residents. Verses 4 and 5. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. Only a few houses, and the temple, and this walking big wall. There's not much else in this whole place. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. And you say, whoa, how does that follow logic? People have few cities, few people in it. city has few people in it. So the Lord put it in my heart to count the people. <coughs> but the connection, of course, is toward chapter 11, verses 1 and following. That's where this book is going. This is the first step toward a repopulation program. After you've got all the people registered, who's a Jew and who's not, and what the family records are, and where they all live, and, and so forth, then there is a culling, an agreed culling of 10% of the
the various segments of the population who then are charged with moving back into the city. Now, we'll deal with that tomorrow. But that's what's going on here. This is the first step. The Lord, he says, put it in my heart to get everybody together and start this registration program because this is the first step toward a repopulation program for the city of Jerusalem. Building the wall isn't enough. You've got to rebuild the fabric of the city and that finally turns on building people. And part of getting that kind of agreement then is not only the registration, but as we'll see in chapter 8, getting the people to come under the authority of the word and understand again what the covenant is about, what it means, what it signifies, what it means to be faithful to this God. So it's not just an arbitrary secular 10% culling by some uh, arbitrary authority, that this is something that people want to do to rebuild Jerusalem as the center of the great king. Jerusalem at this point is a long way from Jerusalem's historic past, when in the language of Jeremiah 33, the streets were full of the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom. Of Jerusalem's anticipated prophetic future, the city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing Zechariah 8. Still more like a ghost town. After all, most of the builders we saw already in chapter 3 came from other towns in Judea. They had returned home. They didn't live here. And so the text is heading toward a population program. Now, for this initial registration, what Nehemiah uses is a record that is about 75 years old. It's the record found, essentially, in Ezra 2, that lists the people that came in the first wave back, about 50,000 of them, give or take. He uses it now for his own purposes and incorporates into it a number of brief memoirs and comments and asides and so on that I don't have time to go into, although many of them are really very interesting indeed. Once we get down to chapter 7, verses 64 and 65, what we discover is that some people lost their genealogical connections and couldn't prove anymore, for example, that they were Levites or priests. They may have been, but they couldn't prove it anymore, and that disqualified them then from serving in the temple. Now, it's worth pausing to think about that just for a moment. Today, no Jew can prove conclusively that he comes from the line of David, for example. In the first century, you could still prove it, because the records have been preserved in the temple. But because of various pogroms against Jews across the centuries, Everywhere there are breaks here and there. It's remarkable how full the record is, but nobody can prove conclusively today that somebody descends from the tribe of Judah from the line of David. Now, you meet a Jew by the name of Kohen, which is English transliteration for the Hebrew word for priest, and there's a jolly good chance that there's a priestly line back to the tribe of Levi somewhere. But even that, you can't prove. You can't prove it just from the name. The records all have gaps. So if somebody came along today and claimed to be the Messiah, the first deficit would, that he would, would be that he couldn't prove himself to be either biologically or in authority descent, in kingly descent terms, genuinely connected with the line of David, do you see? But in the first century you could prove these things, and here in the fifth century, this is about 445 BC, fifth century before Christ, then you could demonstrate that you were of the line of uh, Levi, and if you couldn't, then you were disqualified from the Levitical responsibilities, and in particular from the priesthood. Chapter 7, verse 66, you've got all these numbers. Now they refer to the original numbering. The registration of the people again is probably bringing the numbers up to date, because ultimately you want to have a column, one-tenth, ten percent, do you see? That's coming in chapter 11. Now, what should we say about this passage? Obviously, it doesn't apply to us directly. We're not trying to build a building here that is uh, as big as a city and then put a whole lot of people inside. We're not going to start pulling 10% of our churches in order to build something else. Yet, even here, what you discover is a primacy for the people of God. The city building, the wall itself, is not an end in itself. We saw that already in Nehemiah's concerns. He's not just concerned that the city of Jerusalem be rebuilt because that's his city and he wants it to be big and spectacular again with all the flags flying. He's concerned about his own city. 
And he's concerned about his own city, we saw, already in chapter 1, because he wanted to be filled with people who revere God. God had chosen this city. God had chosen this city as the city of the Davidic king, who was to reflect the great king, as the city of the temple where God met with his people through the mediation of priests at the great high feasts of the year, at Passover, for example, or on the day of atonement on Yom Kippur, where the blood of bull and goat was brought in by the priest in the most holy place and offered up in substitute for the blood of the people because of the priest's sins and because of the sins of the people. This was the city that God had ordained, where people came to worship him. And it grieves, it grieves Nehemiah horribly that, that the people do not have these covenantal promises, these covenantal structures, even though they're mandated by scripture. Their sins have dispersed them all over the place. And now he's longing to see God rebuilding the city again so that the old covenant the institutions and structures are, are rebuilt. Not as in, in themselves, but so that the people of God might be built up and to know their God be strong in righteousness again, a people who revere their God. That's what he's hungry for. And sometimes that very simple focus, simple but fundamental focus, on building up the people of God for the sake of the glory of God, through the means that God has ordained under the covenant, the gospel of Jesus Christ himself and all that is attached to it, somehow are merely assumed or squeezed to the periphery while we focus on the programs and argue about the style of singing or fight about the color of the carpet or whatever it is we do. We, we can be so focused on um, marriage seminars and um, retirement benefit structures and who knows what, all of which may have some legitimacy, but at the end of the day, we forget the central things. You know the most dangerous thing going on in evangelicalism worldwide, in my judgment today? I spend an awful lot of time on the road. I find it in a lot of places. It's not this particular denial, or that particular drift. These things can be troubling in some degree or another. But the most troubling thing? <coughs> the gospel becomes, at best, assumed. on other things. We think people in our churches know the gospel, and they don't. By and large, they don't. So the gospel is not something we're excited about, something that is the center of our ministry. It's, it's the assumed thing. While we're really excited about something relatively on the margins, about our particular program, or about our particular target of a, of a niche group, let's say the over 60s in some retirement community or the under 30s in an inner city or whatever. And, and all of those things might be useful to think about, but at the end of the day, if you assume the gospel and then you get excited for the particular program or device or approach or, or style, then the people that you teach get excited about the program and not about the gospel. I've been teaching or preaching now for 40 years. And I've learned that people don't learn everything I teach them. What can I say? They don't. Do you know what they learn? They learn what I'm excited about. So if the gospel becomes something that you believe, and you hold, and you may even understand, but you're not excited about it, then your hearers don't get excited about it. That's not what they really learn. They learn about your program. Now, don't misunderstand me. I think that there are some important lessons to learn from a Tim Keller or a Mark Driscoll or you, you Philip Jensen or whatever name you want to put in those stellar groups out there that are planting churches and seeing things happen in our cities. Of course there are things to learn. Don't misunderstand me. Of course there are. But the thing that we must learn the most is that these men are excited about the gospel. They remember there are people out there, and they remember that it's the gospel of God that saves them, and this for the glory of God and the good of his people. So that while it is important to learn the devices and the methods and all of that, yes it is, yes it is. Every generation, if it is to pass on the gospel to another generation, must be excited about the gospel, or else the next generation doesn't get it. And that is one of the biggest lacunae 
in all of evangelicalism around the world, one of the biggest gaps. So here then is some security for these people. They are still a pilgrim people. They are still, as it were, making their way back to normalcy. We actually await the repopulation program of chapter 11, verse 1 and following, the dedication of the city to God in chapter 12. But before we get there, things more central than stones and masonry and even repopulation programs intervene. It takes more than walls to make a city. It takes more than marines to establish security. It takes more than money and a building to safeguard the local church. It takes a real knowledge of the Word of God, submission to it, deep, deep compulsion under it. And that brings us to chapter 8. The spiritual nourishment of a pilgrim people. You have to see how the two chapters are connected. When the seventh month came, the Israelites had settled in their town. Now, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. Now, this didn't happen spontaneously. Well, let's go to the water gate. Again, what's presupposed is that this has been organized. This is a Bible conference. And we see already that it is well organized. Platforms have been built. Thirteen specially trained Levites have been instructed by Ezra, who is the chief speaker. This is a well organized meeting. And Nehemiah is leading all of this through the background, through the priest, no doubt. But he's seen that what must come next before the repopulation program comes to fruition is, is that the people themselves must come under the word of God and be excited by it all over again. This clearly is related back to Nehemiah's initial confession in chapter 1, verse 7. Do you recall what he said? We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. So now he's going to start teaching the law of God. And because it's the seventh month, he begins there. For in the seventh month, there was a particular feast that was mandated by the law of Moses, the seventh month in the Jewish calendar. And that is the way this chapter develops. The point already, however, is that you cannot have reformation with this, without the centrality of the Word of God. You cannot do it. Not only knowing it, but conforming to it, delighting in it, hooked by it, passionate about it. You cannot do it. Everything else is noise and razzle-dazzle, short-term fix, but it is not transforming anything. All the entrepreneurial spirit in the world is insufficient if this is lacking. So far, Nehemiah can get very high marks for entrepreneurial spirit. But he himself knows that the Lord has been leading him, leading him in all of this. The Lord put it in my heart to do this. The Lord put it in my heart to do that. And before he moves any further, he wants the people of the covenant community to be restored in their knowledge of, delighting, and conformity to the Word of God. Now then, what we now find are two days of Bible reading and teaching. Both days are characterized by remarkable seriousness before the Word, tears, and joy. Day 1. This brings us down to chapter 8, verse 12. The date, then, precipitates the request. It's the time of the Feast of Trumpets, time to invite Ezra the scribe to a Bible conference for some serious Bible reading. Ezra is called a scribe, or elsewhere, verse 2, Ezra the priest, an older man by this time, he came with a second wave. But priests were charged with teaching the people of the, the, people of the law of God. For example, in Mal Malachi chapter 2, they just weren't those who sacrificed animals and attended to the ritual, they were also charged with teaching the people. That's why he's called not only the priest, but the scribe, and he's the chief one in this regard, transparently. The summary of what takes place is given in verse 3. He read this word aloud, from daybreak till noon, as he faced the square before the water gate, in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. In other words, men, women, and 
children up to whatever, down to whatever age they're still able to understand. They don't stipulate a particular age, but, but if you've got bright kids who are able to understand, include them too. Do you see? That's the idea. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. That's the summary of what takes place. Then verses 4 to 8 fill in some of the details of what happened. You have this wooden platform built for the occasion, and then various dignitaries standing there precisely because they want to signal this isn't just Ezra on his own. And he opens the book, and there's a certain kind of solemn ritual involved with people standing before God as he praises the Lord Almighty. And all the people cry, Amen and Amen. And the Levites, 13 of them, are carefully carefully instructed by Ezra themselves, so that after Ezra reads and begins with some preliminary exposition, apparently they break up into groups, not groups of three or four, or forty or fifty. If you have most of the clans represented here, you have thousands and thousands here. You break this up and you have at least a few thousand of some of these groups as, as this priest and then that priest and the other priest that begins to instruct these various smaller groups. If you ask yeah, 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 Don, no, this looks like uh, inflated figures to me. I mean, they didn't have PA systems in those days. How does dear old Ezra speak to everybody? I mean, if nobody hears here, I'm just getting a little closer to the microphone. You see it. But, but, but Ezra couldn't do that. But you, you forget, nevertheless, that there are lots of indications from the past when people spoke publicly that they could sometimes address very, very large numbers. George Whitfield. For example, in the, in the 18th century, was known to speak to vast numbers of people. He, he would speak downwind, often with a sounding box behind him, and um, preferably in a valley. And he had this big, booming voice that carried well. And according to Benjamin Franklin, who was no Christian, but was certainly a friend of um, <coughs> Whitfield, on one occasion, Benjamin Franklin went around the outside of the crowd as far out as he could go and still hear. And then he calculated the number of square yards and walked through the crowd to estimate how many people were standing in each square yard and figured that dear old George was preaching to 50,000 people. Now, I couldn't do that. I don't have that kind of vocal cords. I don't buy well, need to. I got this thing, don't I? And, 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 and the projections here are formidable. So, you might have had within the city walls in the right corner, the wind going the right way, some, some powerful voices here. But nevertheless, in all of this, there's a breakdown of the people into smaller groups of a few thousand, and, and the priests themselves are involved, and they're passing on the instruction that they've received, and, and the Levites are now doing their job. You see, it's a Bible conference. What's especially interesting, however, is verses 7 and 8. They read from the book of the law of God. So we have a reading. Then they make it clear. And then they give the meaning so that people can understand what's being read. Now, the, the expression making it clear in the NIV probably is to be rendered translating it. That's what the Hebrew probably means. You see, the Bible, the Old Testament, was written almost entirely in Hebrew. But at this point, the people were increasingly speaking less Hebrew and speaking Aramaic. That was a cognate language. Um, it's the sort of difference that you get between, let's say, Spanish and Portuguese. Um, a, a Portuguese person can understand a Spanish person. A Spanish person cannot understand a Portuguese person. And the reason is the Spanish have pretty pure vowels, and the Portuguese can understand them. The Portuguese-speaking person has only diphthongs. I mean, all vowels are here, or here, or and then it's very difficult for the Spanish person to get them all straight, you see? It's like somebody from the deep south of the United States. They don't have any pure vowels either. Hi, hi. You got only three vowels right there. And it's very difficult for somebody who comes from Scotland, where they have only pure vowels, to understand them. Uh, and then the difference of, in this case, of course, is still you have one language. So you have educated people on both sides who can understand them. In the case of Spanish and Portuguese, there are, there are some other differences. It's that kind of difference. Spanish and Portuguese, they're common languages. They're close, but they're sufficiently different. So the word of God is read in Hebrew, and then somebody translates it to make sure that it's in the common language, the language of the common people. And then it's expounded to make sure that people understand it. That's what's going on at this conference. The text is read, it's translated, and then there's exposition. 
so that the people could understand what was being read. Then in verses 9 to 12, there is a remarkable tension between, on the one hand, tears and lamentations, and on the other, the command to rejoice. Did you see it? It's remarkable. I, I doubt that I would have handled it this way, which only goes to show how wrong I can be. It, it's remarkable. Nehemiah the governor, we're told, and Ezra the priest, and the Levites who are instructing the people, are telling them to stop crying. Here, they're listening to the word of God, and as they hear the word of God, they realize how far away from it they are, how they don't know it, how they've been disobedient to it. And, and, and it's gripping them. They're coming under deep shame and conviction of sin, and they're starting to cry. My inclination would have been, yes, Lord, all the men, conviction of sin, repentance, we're about to have revival here. But interestingly enough, that's not what Nehemiah and Ezra and the rest say. What they say is, stop it. This is a sacred day. It, it's a day for rejoicing. D don't cry now. It, it's very strong language, isn't it? This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, no, 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 go. Make good food. Have a banquet. Have a party. Share your food. Make sure you share with lots of other people. And the Levites calm the people. This is a sacred day. If it's a sacred day, you don't grieve. You rejoice. And then all the people went away and ate and drank, sent portions of food to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words of God that had been made known to them. Now what is going on here? There is something admirable about the tears. Understanding. There is something admirable here. To come before the Word of God and realize how far short you are and be ashamed, there is something admirable about that. And certainly historically, there have been times when God has moved by His Spirit in deep, deep conviction of sin as people have read the Word of God and it has been the first step toward genuine reformation and revival. And you must understand that this is probably particularly telling because. Although in Jewish circles, most boys at least could read, whereas in much of the pagan world, many, many people couldn't read. If in the Roman Empire you had 15%, you could read, that, that would have been a, a pretty good ratio. But in Jewish circles, most boys at least could read, and some girls could too. Yet most of them wouldn't own a copy of God. After all, you're a long way from the 15th century AD when the printing press was built. To have your own copy of these things meant you had to copy it out and of course, that meant that you had to have either vellum or papyrus. Vellum was very expensive. Papyrus wasn't cheap, and these were poor people. And who had the time with a quill pen to copy out all of the Pentateuch? Most of these people wouldn't have had a book. They wouldn't have had the law of God. So unless there had been structures of reading the Word of God consistently, then how would people know it anymore? They, they, they remember bits and pieces and certain rituals and certain words and certain slogans. Some of it is degenerated into superstitious magic and, 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 and some of it's remembered stuff that has been abused and twisted into some sort of arcane theology. They, they don't know what the Word of God says anymore. And so you take a whole morning to read the Word of God, translate it, explain it, keep going on, and we'll see tomorrow. Not only here, but in the feast in the middle of the month for a whole week, and then another big Bible conference after that. They are serious about learning the Word of God. And as the people hear it, they're listening to how much they have overlooked or have been ignorant of, or in some cases just plain flatly ignored. In effect, it, it, it meant defying God Himself. So there is something wonderful about their tears. But then the question becomes, if all of this is true and it's wonderful that they are now facing conviction of their own ignorance and sin and shame before God, why do you have this emphasis on rejoicing anyway? Well, there are two or three things that have to be kept in mind, it seems to me, to make sense of this. Rejoice or lament. Nehemiah and the other leaders are in no doubt. First, as 
these feasts are stipulated by Scripture, they are to be feasts of rejoicing. So if the people are now coming under conviction of sin, because they have not kept the feasts, should they now start keeping the feasts by not making them feasts of rejoicing, but feasts of lament? There, there would be a kind of vicious irony in that, wouldn't there? They're so busy expressing their shame for not actually keeping the feasts, that they don't keep the feasts the way the scriptures actually prescribe them. They should keep the feasts, namely with joy. So in part, you see, the leaders are saying, listen, if you're repenting in general terms about what you have failed to do, fine, well, lament is good. But if you're lamenting over your failure to keep these feasts, then the first thing you've got to do, if you really are sorry for your sin, is to keep it the way it's prescribed. And the way it's prescribed is, this is a time of joy. Get over it. Do you see? That's the first thing. They are insisting that genuine repentance means that you come under the authority of what the Word actually stipulates. Not just react with your emotions but to come under the authority of what the Word actually stipulates. And if the Word stipulates that these feasts are to be preserved with a holy joy, then do it that way. The second thing to recall is that the leaders see where this is going. The reader doesn't just yet, because we're only in chapter 8. Oh, cheer up, tomorrow we come across chapter 9. And chapter 9, we discover, becomes a time with properly led, deep-seated, powerful, deeply emotional, public confession of sin before the whole congregation. In other words, these leaders are not saying, oh, forget the conviction part and the tears part. Oh, let's just have a joy, have a party, send food around. Rather, they're saying, there's a time and place for these things. Right now, this is the time for celebration and joy for reasons that will become clear as you understand what these feasts are. But there is a time of confession coming. There is a time of public repentance coming. They know that after chapter 8 is chapter 9. We'll come to that tomorrow. Then there's a third element. It's found in chapter 8, verse 10. The Levites are going around encouraging these people. They say, this day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, or it's your stronghold, if you like. In other words... The leaders perceive that what the people need to be is strong in the Lord. And that is connected in Scripture very often with joy. Now, it's not joy of a merely dispositional sort, an effervescent personality. Or just drummed up by singing one chorus 15 more times in the hope that it will sort of improve the whole tone. For people that are as old as I am, singing the same thing 15 times merely becomes discouraging. But for some people I know, it can be the building up to sing it another 15 times. But th th that's not the issue here either. It's joy in the Lord. It's joy in the Lord. And what I am sure about is this. These feasts, as they're prescribed, for example, in Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 14, are connected with joy because they celebrate what God has done. We'll see more of that tomorrow. They celebrate what God has done. So that as you come to understand what God has done, celebrated by these feasts, you want to be full of joy because of what God has done. And that means that there is a connection between the sacred and joy. Do you hear that? This is a sacred day. Chapter 8, verse 10. Therefore, stop your grieving and rejoice, for the Lord is your strength. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I strongly submit to you that in some of our churches, we have got the grieving down so well, and the repentance, and our abject recognition of our need, and we don't have enough rejoicing over what God has done. So when people come in and see us, they think we're a bunch of sourpusses. And they're not wrong. It also means that we are not strong. We're just not strong. We're so busy confessing our sins, which we ought to do. We'll come to that tomorrow. 
We're so busy confessing our sins that we fail to see that when you focus on what God has done, the sacred, then there is a correlative joy that must be bound up with it. Or else we probably really haven't understood that sacred very well. So I'm worried about a church that is aiming for joy and happiness because it never deals with suffering and cancer and loneliness and, and all of that. I mean, that's terrible. That's terrible. You come into some churches and everybody's so busy trying to be happy that if you've got any burdens at all, you just feel as if you're letting down the side and you want to go crawling out the door. Either that or you get your next fix on being happy while during the week then you have to go and be miserable all by yourself because you know you've got terminal cancer. That's all that's really on your mind. If you've got terminal cancer, what you must have is deep, deep understanding and delight in what God has done. Not only for this life, but for the life to come. You're facing all kinds of pressures and discouragements, or loneliness at work, or whatever it is. You focus on Christ and the gospel, his bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. On the gift of the Spirit is the down payment of the promised inheritance. You work through the book of Proverbs and you listen to the wisdom of God. And you find brothers and sisters in Christ with whom you can pray. And then you visit some elderly lady in the congregation who really is alone. And you share something of your faith with her. And she's weeping with thanksgiving for your few moments with her. And you suddenly realize this is what the body of Christ is all about. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. Because where you focus on the sacred, that is, on what God has done, for the new covenant Christian, on what God has done in Christ, where you focus on that, you can't help but have joy, or you don't grasp much of it. It's as simple as that. And that's your strength. Don't you worry about Christians who are whining all the time? Just whining all the time. Whinging, whining all the time. half full or half empty? Talk about a glass half full and they'll say which half is the empty half. They're looking for it. Top half or bottom half? I don't care. If it's empty, I want it. They think they're prophetic by running things down all the time. And they never talk gratefully and thankfully and joyfully about the triumph of Christ and the hope of the resurrection. You know, we're only two days away from Resurrection Sunday. And this establishes Christian strength. Christian strength in our own individual lives, in our families, in our relationships. It establishes our security. It establishes our integrity. It establishes our hope. It establishes our relationship. It establishes our love for one another. It establishes our confidence in Christ. It establishes our anticipation of a new heaven and a new earth. It establishes... The, 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 the looking forwardness we have to resurrection existence, all the all because of what God has done in Christ. That's where the sacred is. And the sacred establishes our joy in the Lord. So we find it in the Paulines, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And this from someone who's in prison, thank you very much. Do you see? Because at the end of the day, his rejoicing is not tied to external circumstances anymore. I have learned in whatsoever stand I am there with to be content, he says. Not artificial. It's merely the entailment of a good grasp of the gospel, of what God has done. And for the Jews of the Old Covenant, these feasts were supposed to celebrate what God had already done. You see? We do it again in New Covenant rites and rituals, like the Lord's Supper, to which we'll come tomorrow. This is where Christians are strong in the joy of the Lord. They're focusing on what Jesus has done. And then when people come in, they're attracted not only to our seriousness about right and wrong and moral issues, they're attracted also to our singing and our joy and our ability to handle the vicissitudes of life. Not because we're any better than anybody else, but because we know Jesus and all that he's done. So here, then, is day one of this Bible conference. Now day two. Verses 13 to 18. Apparently, most 
went home at the end of day one. And all the people went away to eat and drink, we're told. And on the second day of the month, verse 13, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the scribe to give attention to the words of the law. In other words, instead of having the whole law here, what we saw earlier, three times as men, women, and those who can understand. Three times. Now, it's the heads of families and the priests and the Levites. They stay for an additional day-long conference. Now, there is importance even in that. If you view yourself as, in some sense, head of family, you ought to be studying the Word of God more than anybody else in the family. Haven't you had it just about up to here with men who insist that they're the heads of the family and never have private devotions, never read the Bible, never study it seriously, never read a book? No, 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 my wife leads the kids in their prayers. No, no, they've even got this right here in Nehemiah's Reformation. They've got the heads of the families and they've got the priests and the Levites staying on for an additional day of Bible reading with some very important results coming out. It's not that others are not welcome. It's not that there are not places for men and women and children all to study the Bible. But if you have responsibility at all for the instruction of others, you probably won't have to study some more. Or else, in fact, you end up with a lot of ignorant people in the family, in the church, and elsewhere. It's part of the entailment of responsibility of leadership, whether in the family or elsewhere. What they are studying on this day two of the seventh month it transpires, are the texts related to the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, it's variously called. When Ezra led the people in a celebration of this feast, the emphasis was on the appropriate sacrifices. That's way back in Ezra 3. He had done that already. Now, there is a kind of focus on the booths themselves and commentary on what it signifies. In Ezra 3, he focuses on the stipulations of Numbers 29. Here, I think, the focus is on texts like Leviticus 23, 39 and following. Let me explain what's going on. The Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, was a feast that God ordained so that once his covenant people had got into the land of Israel, they would not forget their years of wilderness wandering. So he ordained that once a year, Starting in the middle of the month, on the 15th day of the month, the 7th month in the Jewish calendar, they would go up into the hillside and bring in olive branches and myrtle trees and other sorts of things, plants with broad leaves, and build little shanties. Do you have a word for shanties in, in, in New Zealand that's uh, purely New Zealand? Shanty, yeah. Little <laughs> shanties, little booths, that's what they are. And many of the, the, the house, uh, houses built in those days had flat roofs, so that even in the cities where, where buildings were often squished together, you, you, you build them up on the roof. And if the case of Jerusalem now, without any buildings, then you build them down in the courtyard and around the temple precincts, and you, you build them up in the countryside. You build them anywhere you could, and you live in a shanty. It is sort of an ancient equivalent of a pup tent. Because it's a way of indicating, you see, that you remember your years, 40 years of wilderness wandering, when God protected you, he not only took you out of the land of Egypt, but he brought you into the land of promise, and you're still a pilgrim people. You not only were a pilgrim people, in one sense, you still are a pilgrim people. This reminds you of what God has done in the past. It reminds you that here, your home, with its with its VCR, and, and with its DVD players, and with, with its uh, air conditioning, and, and its heating, and, and with, with your two cars in the garage, and all, all of that, that, that that's, that's not permanent. That, that, that's not the final thing. You live in the shanty to disconnect you from the stability of life and make you remember what God has done in the past and makes you anticipate what God will do in the future and you're still a pilgrim people. You belong to God. So it was supposed to be a time of rejoicing as well. Time of rejoicing when you remembered how the God, the, the God of Israel brought you out of the land of, of slavery, you see? And you're here and you're still a pilgrim people under his watch care. A wonderful time. So all of this is carefully instructed to the leaders. And then, we're told, preparations were made and the feast began on the, 17th, on the 15th of the 7th month. So, 
What we're told is that um, after they've read these texts and understood them and explained their theology and all the rest, they will actually quote a text, go out into the hill country and do this and that. Now, these leaders go back to their families, they instruct the families and all of these things, and the people then go out and bring back branches and build themselves booths on their own roofs and in their courtyards and in the courts of the house of God and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built booths and lived in them. In the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. The reference to Joshua is already interesting, isn't it? Because, you see, it's not just <coughs> Joshua in, as a time marker. Joshua led them in the celebration of the Feast of Booths after they had come out of the initial wilderness wanderings. Now, Nehemiah is leading them in the celebration of the Feast of Booths after they come out of the exile. And so they're all more aware of what God has done for them. <coughs> Thankful, but though they're a pilgrim people in transition, God, God exercises his providential watch care over them. And they're thanking God and full of joy for all that they have experienced. And then, according to the stipulation in Holy Scripture, according to Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 10 and 12, Moses stipulates that every seven years at this festival, the festival of the Feast of Booths, the Torah, the law of God, is to be read every seven years. Because you see, so many of them didn't have their own reading of Scripture, their own Bibles to read. And yes, the local rabbis, and that's a later term, but local priests and scribes were supposed to teach the people, but many of them didn't have it. So there had to be a public venue for reading the whole counsel of God. And so we read verse 18 as this feast begins. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. There's time in seven days to get right through the Pentateuch. I don't know if that's what they did, but there's time. It doesn't take that long to read. They celebrated the feast for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. That is, on the eighth day, on the seventh year, Often there was a special assembly for a special focused reading of the Word of God. It was not celebrated all the time. It was celebrated on some occasions, and I think that's what is meant in John chapter 7. We'll come to this tomorrow as well. Where on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stands up on the Feast of Tabernacles and says certain crucial things too. Because he wants people to understand how he fulfills the law of the Tabernacles. Well, we'll come to that one tomorrow. Thus, day two kicks off the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And once again, the people are nourished by the Word of God along their pilgrim journey, taught the whole counsel of God. So here on the face of it, then, is this reformation. The people of God, physically now protected, spiritually nourished by Scripture, the leaders learning yet more of Scripture and leading the people in covenant of faithfulness, are now rejoicing at the memory of God's goodness. Providential privilege of being under God's watch care, being his objects of salvation. All of this brought about because God, we're told, sovereignly put it into Nehemiah's heart. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I know that this feels in New Zealand like a day of small things. I know that. That's true in quite a number of countries in the Western world. But I have been on the edge of genuine movements of the Spirit of God in more than one country. Sometimes with very, very different cultural experiences. But I am very convinced of this, both from the Old Testament and from the New, both from my reading of church history and in my own experience. You do not have massive reformation and revival without a recovery of the centrality of the Word. You just do not have it. Now, in one sense, this is the wrong group to say these things to in large measure. I know that. Because the very fact that you're here on a busy Easter weekend trying to hear the Word of God, to study the Word of God, shows that you belong, by and large, to the minority of Christians, where you do keep family devotions, and you do keep private reading of Scripture, and you do, by and large, try to belong to churches.
is where the centrality of the word is really important to you. That's excellent. Don't get discouraged. Work for more of it. Develop a taste for it. Learn in your own constraints, whether in your family or in Sunday school classes or the like, how better to teach the Word of God. Make people full of it. Talk over with those who are experienced, who are a little older than you are, how to have family devotions that are meaningful and rich and encouraging, and not merely one more duty to cram through. Fill your minds with the Word of God. Do you remember when Joshua comes to power? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. And you shall meditate on it day and night. Then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. Or when the king comes to Israel, Moses stipulates in Deuteronomy 17, long years before there is a king in Israel, long years, but anticipating the time when there would be one, Moses stipulates, Deuteronomy 17, 18 and following, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, taken from that of the priests or Levites. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God, and follow carefully all of the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his brothers, and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom. So, he becomes king. What's he supposed to do? Audit the books of his predecessors? Appoint a commander-in-chief? Shake up the cabinet? No. He's to take out his quill pen and copy out the book of the law personally, by hand. Not get somebody else to do it. Still less download it from a CD onto a hard drive without a pass it through anybody's brain. He's to copy it out, log it, so carefully, in Hebrew, that his copied copy becomes his reading copy, which is then when he is to read, this text says, every day of his life in order to learn to revere the words of the Lord his God and not turn aside to the left or the right because otherwise he'll start thinking of himself as better than everybody else and he'll distance himself from God's covenant and stipulations. That's what he's supposed to do. If only those three verses of the law of God had been observed, all of Old Testament history would have been different. So shall we now come to the new covenant and forget these lessons? What does Jesus pray on the night that he is betrayed? Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. You will not grow in sanctification if you do not grow in your knowledge of the word of God. 